Good morning and welcome to Harrisville Baptist Church. We are so glad y'all were able to, to worship and have fun with us in Jesus' house this morning. If y'all would, please stand. This will be our meet and greet. Y'all go around and shake a neck and hug a hand. Hey, Amen. <laughs> He'd have to speak to us, be with his worship hour. God, I pray, Lord, that you will be glorified and magnified in your service today. Let me pray. Amen. Y'all may be seated.
Mallory's already going to. Father and our God, we're just thankful for the opportunity we have to be here in your house today. We're thankful for each person who's here. Thankful, Lord, that uh, you were with our youth and our leaders that uh, were gone this week, that you brought them back safely to us. Pray, God, that you would be with those this hour and this day that lost loved ones in our community and our church family. Let, let I pray a special blessing on Angela and Rowdy's family, just watch over and guide us throughout this day, Lord. Be with Brother Richard and his family as they serve us here in this community, <coughs> Brother Steele and his family as they serve us here. Just thank you, Lord God, for all that you do, and uh, they've come to be with us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
What a week, what a week, what a week. For any of you whose bifocals might need to adjust, or maybe you're seeing us from a distance, we did not come back from Bud Light Fest at the Brandon Amphitheater. <laughs> it does say the darkness and the light, so, uh, but, uh, but we definitely see the similarity there, so <laughs> just know uh, that it was a great, great week to, uh, to get to be with our students, to get to be with some of our adults, and uh, to get to be with Steele and Brandy for the first time on a, on a camp trip. And uh, God blessed us in so many ways. I don't think there was any of us that were a part of that trip that didn't come away challenged, convicted, changed, and encouraged uh, for the week that we had and that we were blessed to have there at camp. You're going to hear, not just today, but over the next coming days and next Sunday as well, more and more about this trip. But I tell you, after, after coming back from a lot of youth camp trips, a lot of Disciple Nows, a lot of extreme winters, and all the activities that we do where, where students' lives are changed, church, let me tell you, the most important thing and the most beneficial thing that you can do is to ask these students individually and in small groups what happened this week and then sit and listen as they tell you from everything they experienced how God worked but don't forget there were some of us older type folks that were there too ask those adults ask those chaperones how the week went and they'll tell you some stories of blessing and transformation and growth and things that God did in their life too ask them don't wait till we tell you about it don't wait well they used to sing a song get involved ask them because that's how the gospel is shared the best. Not through big presentations, but through one-on-one, two-on-one, three-on-one conversations. I know that you will. I know some of you already have, but I encourage you, if you're like, well, I'm, I'm sitting back to wait to what they have to say, go check them out. Go talk to them. Well, I don't know those youth. Well, that identifies the next step in your growth of faith. <laughs> Get to know them. Get to meet them. Some of them have, uh, have come up this week, literally, from our children's ministry and stepped into youth ministry, and they've done great. They have not missed a beat. They have had a great time, and they have been a great group to be around. Uh, if you don't know them yet, get to know them. You're going to want to get to know them. But we are so thankful to be back. We're thankful to, uh, to get to come and to um, get back into our sermon series through the book of Philippians. And uh, we're going to take a look at Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to do the second half. And I've got a t-shirt on, so I don't have my lapel mic on, so forgive me if I fiddle a little bit. We're going to start in verse 15. Remember, we're in the middle of this series, uh, just a little past the middle, uh, as we work through the book of Philippians called Worthy of the Gospel. That's the name of the series. And what it is is a, a part of chapter 1 there that talks about living lives worthy of the gospel. And so we're looking through a list of, of, of characteristics, of, of examples that are set by people who are living lives in Christ and in Christ alone that show because of Christ in them that they are worthy of the gospel. We know that the gospel is given to us in grace, and so we don't deserve it. He doesn't owe it to us, but when he gives it to us, he gives us the ability, the opportunity, and the command to live our lives worthy of the gospel that has saved us. And that's what we're talking about here. These characteristics that we'll look at today, that we've looked at over the past few weeks, uh, they are just simply a list and just part of a much bigger list that we won't get to in this series of what our Christian faith should look like lived out walked out in our lives and we start this morning in verse 15 in Philippians chapter 3 and we read all of us then who are mature should take such a view of things and if on some point you think differently that too God will make clear to you only let us live up to what we have already attained join together in following my example brothers and sisters and just as you have have us as a model keep your eyes on those who live as we do for as i have often told you before and now tell you again even with tears many live as enemies of the cross of christ their destiny is destruction their god is their stomach and their glory is in their shame their mind is set on earthly things but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there the lord jesus christ who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body let's pray together this morning father god we do thank you that we when we put our faith in you through jesus christ we can await and look forward to 
that glorious body that will be given to us, the one that doesn't suffer sickness, the one that doesn't suffer through death, the one that doesn't suffer through anything, but rather is a resurrection body where we can spend all of eternity worshiping you with all the others who have likewise put their faith in Christ. But Lord God, that is to come. But right now, you have for us to live, and we praise you for that. We praise you that we don't just give our lives to Christ at some point in our life and then wait around marking time until heaven gets here. Lord, we're all looking forward to that mansion, but we have work to do here that you've given us. So, Lord, don't let us be that worker that sits at work all day and thinks about home. God, help us to see through your word how we should live so that we might do the work that you've given us to do in a way that honors and glorifies you to the highest. Lord, speak now. Let it be your words and not mine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll tell you, you know, it's, it's so important that we realize uh, more and more, and, and we saw some things this week that you'll hear about in the days to come, uh, that it's, the, this, this Christian life is a process. It is not simply something we get and we have and we file away. How many of you married couples have seen your marriage license lately? Anybody? Grayson, you saw it lately? Like, oh, you're proud of yours. Okay, well, that's good. <laughs> Everybody was like, marriage license? Do we have to have one of those? Well, this is Mississippi. Come on, we don't do that. Uh, our marriage license is in a folder with all of our important paperwork. Now that we have goals like Grayson and Sarah, it will be on our wall very soon. But it's, it's not something that every morning I, we get up and look at, right? It's not something that, that we see. Um, but we live, Sherry and I live, in our marriage. Uh, it's great for me. She's struggling through it, but it's going okay. We, we live it out, right? That marriage license is something that you go and you apply for. State gives it to you, and it's legal. And if, it ever, if you ever have to have it, like it ever has to come up in a, some sort of legal per, you know, pursuance or something like that, well, you get it out, and there it is, right? But most of the time... It's not something that you think about. You know, sadly, a lot of people's Christianity is that way. Somewhere along the line, maybe as a child, maybe as a student, maybe as a young adult, maybe as a middle-aged or older adult, they made a decision. And they said, I know that Jesus loves me, and I know that I'm a sinner, and I know that because of my sin, I can't get to God. There's no way I can work my way to him. I can't do better on my own, and I don't deserve to get to him anyway. But Christ and his love for me died for me, and I want to trust Jesus with all my life. And we hear in that moment, and we know in that moment, that because of that profession of faith, because of that moment where we give our life to him, we are bound for heaven. But so sadly, so many of us, from that moment till the moment we stand at judgment, think, all right, well, I'm good, and we just go along with life. We just coast. We just move along. We do our things. We do the things we already planned. And God's part of it. Maybe we go to church. Maybe we might even serve in church. We just do it. It's just another part of the things we do. Can you imagine if that's how we treated our marriages? Can you imagine if, well, we got the marriage license. Now I'm going to go do all my thing. You go do all your thing. You wouldn't have a marriage very long. That marriage license would come up in that court proceeding that we call divorce court, right? Because when you marry somebody, you live your relationship with them. It's not just something that says, okay, in the eyes of the state, let's move on. Nobody can say we're doing things wrong. It's who you become. You become, the Bible says, one flesh. Same thing with salvation. We don't just get that salvation and then, okay, we're good. Now I can go about my life. We live it each and every day. We live it each and every day. And when we live it each and every day, we start to look more and more like these people that Paul is describing in the letter to the church at Philippi. He said in verse 15 something that teaches us that, that we need to make sure that just like we're talking about with this idea of living out our faith, we need to be pursuing maturity. Elsewhere in Scripture, he'll talk about Christians who are saved but who are still drinking from the bottle or from the breast milk and have not moved on to solid food. If you're 25 years old and you don't eat solid food yet, you're still drinking milk out of a bottle, we call that delayed development, right? <laughs> Something's not quite right there. But yet Christians might live 50, 60, 70 years still just on the basics, never taking a step. 
But he calls us to pursue maturity. We need to be pursuing maturity in our faith. He says, all of us then, why does he say then? Remember the first half of this chapter, he's just finished talking about, as we got to talk about last Sunday morning, he's just finished talking about giving up all the other stuff, giving up all the things that we might would count as benefit or gain, considering all that to be worse than nothing compared to knowing Christ and his resurrection and even his suffering. He says, so since we believe that, he says, we who are mature should take such a view of things. He's not saying, I'm Paul, the apostle, and this is what ultra super Christian apostles do, and you rest of you guys, you just do your own thing. He's saying, every one of us who claims the name of Christ and who believes that heaven is awaiting us because we put our trust in him, as scripture says, every one of us should look at all of our things and our accomplishments and our accolades and our positions that we've earned, so to speak, that we should look at all of that as loss. He's saying we should all look that way. And he says, because he's real, we need to be real about it too. He says, and if on some point you think differently, he acknowledges that we don't always think that way. And that not everybody who is saved thinks that way. But he doesn't leave them there. He says, that too. If you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. What's he saying here? He's saying that he doesn't need some preacher he doesn't need some other brother or sister in Christ or some, you know, some stranger off the street to tell you the things that are wrong with your life. If you know God, if you've trusted Christ and are bound for heaven, guess what? God will show it to you. If you're sitting back over years where you're like, it's great, Rich, but God hasn't really showed me anything. It might be time to check and see if you've really trusted him. Because it's very possible, like so many people in our culture it's very possible that you did a great churchy thing that was expected of you at some point but your heart never changed and if that's the case God is saying by what seems like his silence he's saying to you come to know me for real come to know me truly he says that God will point that out now will God use people in your life to do that absolutely does he have to have them no because he can deal with you and wants to deal with you directly Sometimes he allows other circumstances to come along. Would God do, let evil happen to point me to him? Well, he wouldn't cause it to happen to point it to you, but he will absolutely be there and, take the, and, and, and direct the result of you coming to him through the evil that comes through sin being in existence. Absolutely he'll do that part of it. Paul goes on to say in verse 16, Only let us live up to what we have already attained. You know, maturity is... Uh, <laughs> it's a funny thing sometimes. I uh, had a couple of you ask me this morning, well, how was your week? And, uh, and I'll tell you, it's a, it's a week of perspective. That was part of last week's sermon. A uh, week of perspective, especially after about three minutes of sitting in that river raft on one cheek and uh, realizing that I couldn't feel any of my toes on that leg. Um, that didn't used to be that way. <laughs> even, even four years ago, the last time I rafted, it wasn't that way. Um, you know, and so I'm realizing some things that are different this year at youth camp than they were a few years ago when we did some of the same things at the same place. Walking the hills at Covenant College, um, often driving the hills, to be honest with you, but occasionally having to walk the hills at, at, at the college that we were at this week uh, was a lot tougher at 44 and 300 and none of your business pounds than it has been in the past, right? And so it, it's, it, it's, it's something that I know that it, it ain't like it used to be. But I really believe that maturity is realizing what used to be and what is now and realizing that there's a difference. And what is to come is even different still. Paul says here, we ought to live up to what we've already attained. What does that mean? How is that part of maturity? I mean, that, that almost sounds like, hey, you are what you are. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that at every step of our journey in faith, every breath that we breathe in Christ as a believer, we are who we are, but we're also looking back at who we've been and looking forward to who he's making us. We have to know, we have to be oriented to our place, and that comes with maturity, right? Think about it. People who are immature in just, in just life, not necessarily in Christianity, people who are immature in just life, they, they often are dreamers, right? They, 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 they think about life in a totally different way that it's really not. They see things, and they look forward to something else, and, and you get questions like, 
um, when we're going to get there, <laughs> you know, because it's always not about where we are now and living the moment and understanding who we are now. It's, it's what's to come. Or also immaturity in our lives shows through when we are simply focused and dwelling on the past. But there's a part of maturity that says, know where you are right now. When you're at a place that you're not familiar with and you have a map for it, if there's no you are here point, the map really doesn't help, does it? Because if you don't know where you are, you don't have any idea of any reference point for where everything else is. Paul's saying we need to be pursuing maturity. We need to be growing to a point where we too look at life and the things of life in the lens that Christ gives us to look at them through. We need to be doing that, but we got to know where we are so that we know where we've been and where he's taking us. We've got to do that. We've got to make sure that we're pursuing maturity in that way. He says in verse 17, he says, Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. Now listen, it takes a lot of gumption to tell somebody, hey, do it like me. I'm, I'm pretty weary, or, you know, <laughs> of saying, not weary, wary of saying those words because I know how messed up I can make things. But here Paul is saying, look, You've got good examples in front of you. He's talking about himself and others. He says, follow them. That's a step of maturity that is backed up by some boldness, but also some realization to see that, okay, God has been doing a work in me, and so it's right for Paul to say here, you can follow my example. He says, join, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. So he's saying, you don't just have to do things just like me. Elsewhere in the Gospels, or excuse me, in the New Testament, Paul will say, it doesn't matter who's doing the preaching, or even what the motives they're preaching with, it's that Christ is being preached. He acknowledges that, hey, as long as it's God's way, it's all fine. It's not about my way or your way or somebody else's way. He says, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. He points out that there's others doing it well, too. Find those people in our lives. Another part of pursuing maturity is this. Realize that we're not the best, we're not the highest, we're not the greatest, and then find the highest and the greatest and follow their example. How many of you have YouTubed something lately to find out how to do it? Nobody. This illustration is done. Okay. All right. Me and Miss Sandy are YouTubers. You the rest of y'all are too, don't lie. Some of, some of y'all went to camp, you're too tired to raise that right arm. YouTube's a great thing. It's a terrible thing, but it's also a great thing, right? Because I can learn how to do a lot of things. Can I learn them as well as being with somebody and stepping through it in life with them? Probably not. But I can at least get an idea of it, right? I can change brake pads now. To a lot of you, that may not be a big deal. But to me, it was because I didn't grow up learning how to do that. But you know how, you, how I learned it? I watched YouTube. And all our cars stop today. So you can learn how to do that, right? This is more, though, he's talking about not just watching YouTube to learn how to do things. He's talking about getting in with people who are living their life, and they are pursuing maturity. Part of us pursuing maturity is getting in with them and being guided and directed and being an apprentice of theirs. He says in verse 18, For as I, as I have often told you there, or excuse me, before, and now tell you again, even with tears, he's passionate about what he's telling them, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. As we're pursuing maturity... Sadly, what we see is, is that not everyone is pursuing maturity. And even more sadly, what we see is, is even though we think about people as good people a lot of times, they're not godly. They're not Christians. They've not put their trust in Christ, and Christ is not the one who is guiding and leading and motivating their every step. And Paul says, make sure that also, as you're pursuing maturity, make sure that you're to help you to be able to be understanding loyalties, too. Because our world is filled with a myriad of different loyalties that people have to different people and different causes and different things. For as many people as there are, there are multiple extra loyalties that we have. I have a loyalty to my family. I have a loyalty even within my family to my wife and to my girls and to my mother and to my father and to my brother and sister and, 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 and else, uh, otherwise people in our families as we continue to go out from the nuclear family. I have, a, I have a loyalty to our church. I have a loyalty to 
the people that are my friends. I have a, people, a loyalty to the people that are the community that we serve. There's all kinds of different loyalties. You have the same thing in your life. You have a loyalty to the parts of your family that make up your family as a whole and the people that are that, are that family. You have a loyalty to your job. You have a loyalty to your, your, your clubs and your groups and the things you're doing. You have a loyalty to your ball teams and to your bands and all the things. We're, we have these loyalties. There's all kinds of loyalties that we have, each of us, in our lives. And Paul says, remember that as you're pursuing maturity and as part of that pursuit, remember that not everybody's going in the same direction. Real quickly, and I, I, there's, this may be a whole other sermon down the road, uh, as Jason and I were sitting in the front of the boat um, rolling down the river uh, on Friday afternoon, you know, it, it, God always is teaching us stuff, you know. I think God was teaching Jason, don't ever get in a, in a river raft with somebody that large. Uh, but, he, you know, it, it was so important. Jason, you guys, you guys that also rafted, back me up on this. It was so important that we not only rode strongly, but that we rode together, right? That when we put our oar in the water, it wasn't just what I wanted to do. It was what was best for the group, and so we had to have loyalty to each other. But it wasn't just that. As, as expert rafters as we all were going in, and even more so now, we still had to have somebody that really was calling the shots. It was really literally steering the boat, and that was our guide in the back who weighed probably a little bit less than this Bible right here. It concerned me greatly. Uh, but she was awesome. <laughs> she, too. There you go. <laughs> Some of you caught that. Uh, she was awesome. And she told us up front, this is how it works. When we got to the river itself, she told us again, this is how it works. And then when she said something, we did it. So it wasn't just enough that we had to be loyal to each other. We had to be loyal to her and listen to her and trust her and do what she said. And there were a couple times where we did that greatly and a couple times where we may or may not have and we got stuck. And then we still had to turn right back around and listen to her and work together. And I had to take my big tail from the front left corner of the boat to the back right corner of the boat and... That's why I can't barely walk today. Anyway, we have to have those loyalties, but we have to recognize that there's other loyalties out there. He said, for I've told you before, and now I tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. What does it mean to be an enemy of the cross of Christ? Put simply, it means to be a, excuse me, it means to be a human who is not yet a Christian. You say, wait, wait, that doesn't sound right. When the Bible talks about enemies of the cross of Christ... It absolutely is speaking to everyone for whom Christ sacrificed himself who has not yet trusted him. That's the simplest definition of being enemies of the cross of Christ. Well, wait a minute, I'm a pretty good person. That's great. But that has nothing to do with your position towards the cross of Christ. The only thing that changes our position towards the cross of Christ is us surrendering our lives fully and totally to Christ. It's the only thing that changes it. It's the only thing that makes a difference. The only thing. Scripturally speaking, not my opinion, not your opinion, so it doesn't matter really what we think about it. What Scripture tells us is that there's two types of people in the world. Those that are for the cross of Christ, and they've given their life to Christ. And those who have not are the other group, and they're the enemies of the cross of Christ. So this is not just talking about the people who would want to attack Christian religion. This is not just people who hate people in churches and don't think churches should do anything. This is not the people who have been hurt by churches and have chosen to attack them in so many different ways he's not talking about mean people or rude people or people who are actively attacking the cross of christ and those who follow it. it's just simply a state of being without christ's intervention we would be all enemies of the cross of christ and it's only for what he's done on the cross and him bringing us to him that we can step over the lines and become a friend an ally a part of the kingdom of the cross of Christ. He says in description of these folks, and again, talking about everybody who's outside of Christ, their destiny is destruction. That seems kind of harsh, but it's true. They may live what seems to be a very successful life. They may have money, they have, may have cars and houses and boats and vacation homes and all the things, a huge 401k and retire early and have a yacht and go all over the world. They may have all the things that we want. All the things that we think are great, all the things that the world says is good and successful. But Christ is very clear 
There's going to be a day where all of us stand before him in judgment, and it's not a sliding scale. It's either you're with him or you're not by that point, which is why it's so important that we don't waste our time chasing after other things. We have to understand these loyalties, and we have to figure out how to make sure that in him and his power, he brings us, and we follow him to let our loyalty be to him ahead of everything else. He says their destiny is destruction. What does that mean? Does that mean that, oh, man, if you don't follow Christ, if you're not in Christ, then all bad things will always happen to you? No, your life might look a whole lot better than some Christians' lives here. But ultimately, destiny, where you're destined to be living that life, is destruction. We call that hell. He says their God is their stomach. Some of us in the room go, wait a minute, hang on a second now. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Why does he say it that way? Is it because overeating is bad? Yes, but that's not all of it. Is it because exercising is good and taking care of our body is good and we don't always do that? Yes, but that's not all of it. What he's saying is, what is the thing that you do in public and private, wherever, throughout each day, that you have a need You feel the need, you do something about the need, and the need goes away. It's eat, right? I mean, think about it for just a second. Very seldom are we in life, in where we live in the world, in a place where we get hungry and we can't find something to eat. Maybe it's at our house, maybe it's on the road, maybe it's at the gas station, whatever. We can find something to eat, and there's something to eat everywhere, It's crazy to me that the boutiques that I go in with the girls from time to time that sell all these cute clothes and purses and necklaces and all that stuff also will have like a little chocolate something up at the counter. I mean, there's food everywhere. What he's saying here is that they are people who are looking for immediate satisfaction, immediate gratification. And that's contrary to what we get in Christ. Now, Christ does give us pleasure. Christ does give us joy and happiness in the moment. But the the true hope of the gospel comes from understanding that in all of eternity, our place will be good. And that the things we suffer through here, no matter what they are, we we, we don't have to act as if those are the only things that will ever happen to us because he will wipe away every tear and he will dry every eye and he will bring a time where we are not having to worry about immediate gratification. We'll have eternal gratification. It says that their God is their stomach. He said, and their glory is in their shame. Is this just the person who's like, yep, I'm bad, I'm going to hell, and I know it? No. This is one of those things about perspective from last week that's important. Sometimes we glory in things that we think are great, but in reality, and ultimately we find out, they are shameful. We glory in how great we are, and then we find out that, no, that was just us really struggling and falling in the sin of pride. We think about how blessed we are, And then we think about, yeah, but that was motivated by and sustained by all my greed. We think about how smart we are or how whatever we may be. And we later find out that the real root of that was not Christ. It was us. And therefore, it'll be put to shame. He says their mind is set on earthly things. Folks, this morning, if our mind is set on earthly things, they can't be set on the things of Christ. We only have one mind and as many times we like to think that we're good at multitasking ultimately we can only focus our mind in this way on one thing at a time i hope and god makes a way for it to be this way that it's christ for each and every one of us lastly this morning in verse 20 he says but our citizenship he's he's making a a contrast here he's saying this is the way people outside of the cross of christ people who are enemies of the cross of christ live but for those of you who are in christ he says but Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. The last thing we need to make sure we understand in this part of the book of Philippians is we need to be accepting citizenship. We need to be accepting our citizenship. Now, we mentioned already a few minutes ago talking about Mansion Over the Hilltop and singing that song. It's not just simply about, well, I know where I'm going, so none of this matters. No. Part of being a citizen of heaven is knowing that we are citizens there and missionaries here. We're not just so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. You've heard that statement, that phrase before, haven't you? That's not it. We need to know that our citizenship is in heaven, which means that we are travelers here. And travelers don't just go to just say, well, I was there. 
they go to do things. If you're on vacation as a traveler, you go to see the sights, to do the stuff, to, to go to the parks, to go rafting, to go to camp, whatever. You know, when you're doing that type of travel, that's what you do. And if something happens and you don't get to do those things, what happens? You get disappointed. There was a huge storm coming through that we were driving through on the way to raft, and Jason and I were you know, sitting in the front of the, of the van talking about, ooh, if it's pouring down rain like this, this ain't going to be fun for anybody. <laughs> but you know what? We'd have been disappointed if we'd have got to the rafting place and, and it was too rainy for us to go. Thankfully, it wasn't. It was beautiful by the time we got there. Everything was good, and so we got to drink the entire river. Uh, but some of you have been rafting. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of you have not. Try it. You'll see. But we didn't get disappointed there, but if we had been, we would have been upset. When we travel for business, what do we do? We don't just go and lay up in the hotel that our companies put us in. If we do, we get fired, right? We go and we go to the meetings. We go and make the sales call. We go and, you know, go to the conference or whatever it is that we're supposed to travel for. As travelers, we have a point to the travel. As citizens of heaven, and sojourners or travelers, as the Bible tells us, in this world, we have things to do. The weird part about it is, is we were born here, and we become later on at some point in our life citizens of heaven, and so we, then we have to do what? We have to make a change in how we live our lives. Because what used to be our citizenship is now the place we're traveling to. He says our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await to be reunited with God fully and, and formally and face-to-face, -face, whereas now we are reunited with him in our hearts and in our spirit and in our future, but we're still here. He says we eagerly await a Savior from there to come and set all things right, and he will, and he is. And that Savior is the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, he has all the power, which means, guess what? Men, women, guys, girls, we don't. He has the power. We can't change much of nothing in our life. He changes everything. By the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, he'll transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body, that resurrection body we talked about just a few moments ago. That body that is the perfect weight. That body that is able to move and run and jump and raft and not be sore for three months later. That body that is all eternity ready. We've got to make sure that while we're looking forward to that, while we know if we've put our faith in Christ and we've been saved, that that's our, where our citizenship lies, we've got to know, too, that he's got us here for a reason. And so we don't get caught up in all those reasons and let them overtake our citizenship, but no, we keep our focus where we're supposed to be. We understand who we are. We're pursuing maturity. We're trying to grow in him. We're laying down our life where we need to stop trying and just give it over to God. And through him, by that submission, we're pursuing maturity. We're understanding that around us, not everybody's doing the same thing. Even those who say that they're part of the body of Christ, they may not have the same loyalties as God is calling us to have. And therefore, to remember that that's all fine, well, and good. But if we know Christ, our citizenship is in heaven, and he's got us here for a purpose. You notice that phrase that was in the middle of that last part of that statement, if we know Christ. This morning, no matter who you are, Jesus died on the cross willfully and purposely for you, for me, for the person next to you, for the person in other churches that are worshiping, and the person who has decided they'll never, ever step foot in the church and doesn't care anything about God. Jesus died for them, too. Therefore, his sacrifice that makes all this possible is effective for you and for me and for them, each and every one of us. He doesn't wave a magic wand and say, okay, everything's better. Now, poof, you're, you're saved. He gives us what we seem to think we want the most but seem to do the worst in. He gives us a choice. He gives you a choice and me a choice. And that person who's in other churches a choice. And the person who never is going to go, we all have a choice to give our life to him. To believe that he is who he says as we get to see and read in his holy word. And to say, yes, I agree with that because I believe it to be true and it has stood more than the test of time. And I want to give my life to him. We have a choice. You have a choice this morning. If you've not given your life to Christ, you say, well, what does that mean? That means that at some point in your life, 
you've realized that you're off the rails that God has put you on for life. The rails are defined and described by his word. And if your life looks different than that, then that's what he's trying to tell you. It doesn't have to keep being this way. It doesn't have to stay that way forever. And he's saying, come to me. And to give your life to Christ is simply to say, okay, God, I get it. I get it. It's not about me. It's about you. Forgive me because I know I've done things that have hurt your heart. And save me and enable me and strengthen me and motivate me to learn how to do the things that glorify you instead. And that moment is what we call salvation. Now, as some of our students saw this week, sometimes in our life, we, we think that, hey, we're there. But then God works in ways, teaches us things, shows us some things, and we realize maybe we're not there. Folks, salvation is too important to just hope that something I did in the past was good enough. This morning, I don't care if you're 95 years old or older. I don't care if you've been a Christian, you, you've said, for all the years of your life. If God's saying to you today that your life's not what it needs to be, and he's saying it's because you never really put your faith in him, that's nobody else talking if it leads to you being sure. And so there is nothing that says, oh, well, I'm just going to sit in my pew right here because you know what? A long time ago, my mama was very happy that I got saved and I got baptized. That's great. If your mama's sitting with you or if your mama's already in heaven or wherever mama may be, if you're sure today that today you need to give your life to Christ, it's not so much about dishonoring what happened all those years ago. It's about honoring God and honoring your parents and what happens right now. Oh, don't be a teenager, an adult, a senior adult who sits in a pew and thinks, well, I kind of feel something going on here. I know something needs to be different, but I'm good. I'm, I'm good. That, that's the devil talking to you. That's the one who doesn't want you to have that future in heaven. And so, folks, of every age, I encourage you, if God's saying, give your life to me, do it. Do it this morning. Don't put it off. Don't go and do some more research. Because guess what? We're never going to get to heaven and stand at judgment and go, you know, Rich, you gave your life to me when you were 44. But you know what? You were really saved back then, so you messed it all up. Why don't you go on the other way? No. He's going to say, welcome in, my good and faithful servant. Here, enter into your reward. The rest of it is just stuff we've kind of put on there. So I encourage you this morning. If you've not given your life to Christ, if you're not sure you've given your life to Christ, today's the day. If God's talking to you, you follow him. If you have, and yet you see that there's, in these three areas we talked about this morning, or any, any other number of areas, that your life is not growing where it needs to grow, not glorifying God in the way it could be, then make a fresh dedication to him this morning in that area of your life. You've given your life to him. You are saved, but you know you're not always living everything right. Man, do some business with God. Get on your knees before him and let him put you right back on the right track. You may be on the rails, but you, your engine ain't working so good. Let him fix your engine. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's a, a decision that students you made at camp this week that you want to come back and share publicly with your church. You can come. You don't have to come this morning, but you absolutely can come. If you want to talk to your parents or a little bit more, that's okay. So no pressure right here. But if you'd like to come and talk about a decision and make it, make it, make it public before this body of believers who love you so very much, you're welcome anytime we give these invitations. Folks, this invitation is for them, and it's for you. It's for us, all to God's glory. Let's pray together. Father God, we love you, and Lord God, we thank you that you still call us that you want us to grow in maturity, that you understand and you, you see and you want us to see that we're not always going to see things alike and be at the same journey, point in the journey and point of the path. But Lord, all the more that as we mature, we need to place our faith and our loyalty in you. Lord God, we thank you that you do make us citizens of heaven even before we get to be there and you have a purpose for us here. Lord God, whether it be for salvation whether it be for a, 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 a just a, a coming back to you, a, a, a reinvigorating of our faith, a rededication, or whether it be something more specific, maybe it be coming to join this church. Whatever you're working in the hearts of men, women, boys, and girls today, let us follow you even now as we sing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand.
Amen. Please have a seat. And uh, we are talking about our ministry spotlight uh, this morning. We have a church council meeting coming up next Sunday afternoon at 3.30. Now, the last church council meeting, we have it once a quarter. Uh, it was kind of slimly attended. If you are a chairperson of one of our committees or you are a leader of one of our ministries, we desperately need you to be with us next Sunday, the 25th of July at 3.30, down here close to the church office there in, that Sunday, in the adult three Sunday school room. Please make sure to be, make plans to be there. If something in life is keeping you from being there, let us know and send somebody else from your committee, from your ministry, from your group, and let them be there so we can work some things together. We're at a great time. I know right now that there's some things going on in, with COVID that are, are very scary, again, uh, that, are, that are hitting people closer to us than, than we've been used to for the last few months at least. Um, and, uh, and we're, of course, as a church, watching that as closely as we possibly can. But we're also planning for the best, right? We're ready to deal with things if they, if they go sideways, if, if we have an outbreak, things like that. But we're planning as if God is going to keep us on the track that he's had us on of being able to meet together. The church council meeting is very important for that. So please make sure that you're there, uh, 3.30, next Sunday, July 25th, uh, and be a part of it with us, okay? All right. Anybody else got any announcements? We're looking for some more softball players. Kyle Neely is the captain and the skipper of that ship, so, uh, so get ready, Kyle, and uh, bring us home a victory. I'll be keeping stats like a champ with you. It'll be great. We love you. Y'all have a great afternoon. Come back at 5 o'clock this evening for all kinds of different activities as well as Bible study. Oh, hey, we should do an offering, shouldn't we? Let's do that. The deacons are standing there. You'd think I'd notice it. Right there. Hey, Charlie. Excuse me, the ushers. Ushers, come on down. Let's do our offering. Father, we come to you this morning, Father, just a blessing to be in your house. And God, as I always ask personally, would you forgive me personally my sins? There's so many. Father, we thank you for your words this morning. Father, most importantly, we pray, Lord, that you'll help us to not only hear them, but apply them to our hearts, as I always ask. And just take them to our homes and to our communities and to our work site and just share your word, Father. We come to this portion of service. We thank you for this gift. And Father, we just pray your direction in our church. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. stand. All right, we're going to attempt to do family of God. Yeah. 